This is Math 142, Section 3.2, and we're going to talk about graphs of polynomials. And uh, what I want you to be able to do, two, there's two things, but the first thing I want you to be able to do is take a look at the equation of a polynomial. Now this might be write, written sometimes as y equals this, or as a function like p of x or f of x equals this polynomial. I'll define a polynomial as we're going along. But what I want you to be able to do is look at this and tell me a few things. I, I want you to tell me the maximum number of uh, zeros that it has. In other words, what's the most times uh, that this could spit out a zero? I want to know the maximum number of turns that it has. You know, it's, it's, func it's graphs going to be something like that. How many times will it turn or have a little local extreme? Uh, I want to know the extreme behavior, the end behavior. So the, and the end behavior, that's the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And there's one other thing that you should be able to do too is uh, you should be able to tell me the y-intercept by looking at it. And I want you to be able to do this just by looking at the equation, not, not by looking at the graph. But I'm going to take a sec and take a peek at the graph. So here it is. I, I graphed it in Desmos. I like, I like to use Desmos. It's, it's a good tool. Um, so I'm seeing a couple of things going on here. Like first off, there's that y-intercept at 0, 3. It looks like it has three zeros, or three x-intercepts. Um, now I want to be able to find these eventually. I also notice it has two turns in it. Two turns. Um, to the right-hand side, it's going down or in a negative direction. And to the left-hand side, its end behavior is upward in a positive direction. All right, I should be able to get at all those things just by analyzing the uh, the equation, not by graphing it. So let's get back to that and work on it. So let's talk about the maximum number of turns. Um, ours had two. And as I think about equations, if I just have y equals x, I know that's just a linear equation, straight line. Uh, y equals x squared, and it might have some... And, you know some stuff added in there like plus 5x plus 6 that sort of thing but essentially what happens is you can think of it as I'm, I'm kind of grabbing one of the sides and bending it up and it's almost like it's a rebar it has a little memory in it like it's it bends with it so uh, x squared basically looks like that if I have something that's y equals x cubed plus some other stuff same thing grab one side bend it in a sense, it kind of has a memory that it used to be a parabola, but now it is a cubic. And if I do that again, you know, multiply by another x, again, grab one side, bend it. it might look like it used to be a cubic, but it's bending that way. So uh, if I think about my number of turns, at least in my picture, when I have x to the first period, uh, first power, there's no turns at all. It's just going straight up and down. Oops, so that shouldn't be a 1. That should be a 0. And in this, it turns once. And in this cubic, it turns twice. In this fourth degree, it turns three times. So hopefully you can see that it's, it's related to the degree. It's just one less than the degree. So if I have, you know, some x to some power, and that's the, that's the highest power in here, my number of turns is one less than that. And now, uh, thinking about that, now I can think about the most number of zeros. And right now, I'll, I'll think of zeros as, um, as x-intercepts, how many times it crosses the x-axis. And that's not... x. Uh, these x-intercepts are zeros, but not all zeros are x-intercepts. There's other zeros, and we'll worry about that later. So notice in, in the first degree, I have 1. Second degree, if it turns once, it has the potential to touch it twice. If it turns twice, it has the potential to touch it three times. Notice it's just the same as the degree. So the, the max number of zeros is equal to the degree. All right, so now let's get into what makes a polynomial. Um, I'm going to have a coefficient, right, like this one is negative 2. And then what will happen is I'll have other powers that I'm adding to it, or other uh, variables to the power, power that I'm adding to it. And notice in, in going down, like third power, second power, first power, so x to the n, x to the x, n minus 1, and so on. 
keeps going from there. So dot, dot, dot. And I also have these coefficients, negative two, negative five. So I have the coefficient that goes with the nth term, I have the coefficient that goes with the n minus one, etc. All the way down to the constant, uh, the zeroth one. So that's going to help me think about my my left and my right behavior. So so far I have my degree, give me some stuff about max turns and max zeros. Now how about that left and right hand behavior? We can go back to the graph for this. So as I look at this graph, I want to think about that left hand right behavior and I'm going to get it by thinking about letting x get really big in a positive direction basically approach infinity so I'm going to go to the right right now and notice x is getting bigger the further I go to the right the larger x gets one two three four five six etc so I'm going to think of x as some being something big positively and so if I plug that in I have negative two times a big number to the third power Minus 5 times that same big number squared, plus that same big number, plus 3. Now here's what's great about that. As x gets really big, this term dominates. Like a really big number to the third power is going to be significantly larger than that big number squared, or just the big number. So as x gets large enough in a positive direction, these become insignificant, and this term takes over. So notice I have a really big number cubed. So now it's a really big, bigger number, <laughs> positive, multiplied by a negative number. So eventually this thing will start going down to the right-hand side. So this coefficient tells me if it's negative, as the function goes to the right, it's going to go down. But if it's positive, it would, uh, it would switch. So like if I made this a positive 2 instead, notice now as I go to the right, it ends up going up. For a little while it goes down, but eventually it takes over and starts going up. So that tells me for my left-hand behavior, um, if that leading coefficient, that first number, is positive, then it's going to go, oh no, that's not left, that's my right-hand behavior. For my right-hand behavior, sorry, if uh, this starts... If this is positive, it's going to end up going up or go in a positive direction. And if that's negative, it'll go down. So now that I know my right-hand behavior, I can think about my left-hand behavior. And it's pretty straightforward. I can go back to these pictures. Notice that when x is squared, they're going in the same direction. Or when x is to the fourth, they're going in the same direction. But when it's cubed, opposite when it's first power opposite. So if the power is even, um, it's going in the same direction as the right. But if it's odd, it's going in the opposite direction as the right. So in this case right here, since this is negative, it's going to go down to the right. But since that's odd, it would end up going up to the left, opposite. Let's do another example. Oh, there's one last thing, the y-intercept. Uh, the y-intercept is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, the y-intercept, remember y-intercepts happen when x is 0. Like there's my y-intercept. That would be the point 0 something. So when x is 0, notice what happens. I plug in 0. 0 cubed is 0 times, that's a 0. That's a zero and that's a zero. All that's left is just that, that little lone number that's the end, uh, three in this case, just the constant. So I could say my y-intercept is three. I could also say it's the point zero three. So y-intercept, just this right here, or it could be the point a sub zero. Let's do another one.
All right, I should be able to analyze this just by looking at it. So my maximum number of turns, one less than the degree, 13. My maximum number of zeros is the degree, 14. Now again, that doesn't mean I'm going to have exactly 14 zeros. It just means that's the most I can have. Uh, my right-hand behavior, this is positive, so it'll go up or in a positive direction. My left-hand behavior, this is even, so that I'll go in the same as the right. And then my y-intercept is just that constant, that point 0, negative 2. So now what I want to do is actually find the, the zeros. And it's not exactly true, but we can think right now about zeros as x-intercepts. X-intercepts are a type of zero. Um, not all zeros are x-intercepts. But essentially what we're doing is, when does this thing equal zero? And we know how to do this. This is, uh, this is algebra work. Um, so one technique I could use is to factor this. So if I factor this, things that multiply to 6 add to 5 would be 3 and 2. So this would factor to uh, x plus 3 times x plus 2. You know, and I know that there's going to be at least two of them. Or, I'm sorry, at most two of them. And what makes this a 0? Negative 3. What makes this a 0? Negative 2. So my zeros are negative 3 and negative 2. Great. Um, notice it comes from this factored form. So if I had another polynomial, uh, p of x, and let's say it was uh, x minus 3 times x plus 7 times x minus 4, and it came to me in this factored form, um, I actually don't have to do much work for it, because then uh, what that means is I could just pull my zero straight out of this. So my zeros are going to be 3. What makes that a zero? Negative seven, what makes that a zero? And four, what makes that a zero? There they are. Notice if I were to multiply this out, I'd have an x times an x times an x, and uh, that would be an x cubed, which gives me that, that, there, that there would be three uh, at most of those zeros. All right, the rest of what I wanna do is gonna be a technique um, on how to, how to find some of these zeros. So it'll, it'll be some recall of uh, some factoring techniques that you have seen before. We want to find all the zeros for this for this polynomial. And what's nice is I have this x cubed. I know there's going to be at most three. There shouldn't be more than three. So I'm going to factor this. So a couple of factoring things. Uh, one is always look to see if you can factor something out first. As I look at this one, they all have an x in them. So I actually can factor an x out first. And if I do that, what I'm left with is an x squared minus 2x minus 3. And now I'll try and factor what's left. I have x times things that multiply to negative 3 and add to negative 2 uh, minus 3 and positive 1. And here it is. It's, it's in factored form. What makes this a 0? Zero, 0. What makes this a 0? 3. What makes this a 0? negative one. And there's my zeros for that one. All right, let's try another one. So negative 2x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 3x squared. I notice these all have an x squared in them. I'm going to take an x squared out, factor that out first. But I'm also going to take a negative sign out just to make that, uh, just to make that initial term positive. So if I take out a negative x squared here, I'm left with a 2x squared. Here the sign switches plus x. Uh, here the sign switches minus 3. So I have to figure out how to factor this one out. I want that middle term to be a 1. So how about I make this a positive 3 and this one a negative 1. 3x minus 2x. That would make my middle term positive 1. So notice my zeros. What makes this a 0? Zero? 0. 
zero squared is zero. What makes this a zero? Negative three halves, right? I'm solving this, two x plus three equals zero. Subtract three from both sides, divide by two. And what makes this one one? Now, uh, this x minus one, that gave me the one, this two x plus three, this gives me this. But notice this x squared. This x squared, I could think of this as x times x. So this zero actually happens twice, right? Even though I only have three zeros, I had potentially four, this zero counts for two of them. So what we do is we say this has a, a multiplicity of two. And what's interesting to me about that is, let me look at what that graph looks like. So there's my, there's my zeros, one of them's here, that negative three halves in there, zero. Now this one that has a multiplicity of two, this zero, notice it looks like a little parabola there. It doesn't actually go all the way through, it just touches it. If a zero has a multiplicity of two on the graph, it's gonna look like a little local parabola through that, through that zero. And that's a, something I want you to remember. So let's go ahead and find zeros on both of these. And on this first one, should be at most three. So I have these four terms here. So this is a technique that um, you may have seen before. This is gonna be factoring by grouping. And what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna group the first two terms and I'm gonna group the second two terms. So looking at these first two terms, these both have an x squared in them. So I can actually factor an x squared out of the first two terms, leaving me x minus two. And then with the second two terms, um, I have this minus four x and an eight. I could, they both have a four in them. And I'm actually gonna take a negative four out. So negative four. So notice what that leaves me is x, and this divided by four, this eight divided by four, is a two, but it's a negative, so the sign switches. Now here's what happens with factor by grouping. I'm left with the same thing in there, like an x minus two in each of these. So in a sense, this is like x squared times a minus four times a, where the a is just an x minus two. And in this case, I could factor the a out, which would give me a times x squared minus four. Same idea. I'm since this is the same, this x minus two, I'm gonna factor an x minus two out. What that leaves me is x minus two times x squared minus four. And um, this x squared minus four, I can factor this again, this is difference of squares. So I have x minus two times uh, x minus two times x plus two. So, my zeros are two, but it comes from two places. That has a multiplicity of two and negative two. So again, on the graph, that'll look like a little, little local parabola. All right, I'm gonna do this next one too. Um, factor, I'm gonna group them. So think about these first two grouped together. And with these, I could factor out an x squared, leaving me a two x minus one. With these two, uh, they have a nine. And since that's a negative, I'm gonna take out a negative nine, and that leaves me two x minus one. Whoops, that was an x squared, sorry. Two um, x minus one. So same idea, I can factor out a two x minus one. I'm left with this difference of squares, so that will factor. And I know my zeros have to be one half, set it equal to zero and solve it, negative three and three.
So I want to take a look at that idea of a, of a multiplicity or a repeated root. So I'm going to take just a basic uh, polynomial that's in factored form, uh, x minus 2, x plus 1 times x. <clears throat> y equals that. And now you should be able to look at that and say, oh, I can tell that there's a 0 at 2, there's a 0 at negative 1, and there's a 0 at 0. So let's graph this and see what it looks like. So it was uh, y equals x minus 2 times x plus 1 times x. And yeah, sure thing, there's those zeros. There's one at positive 2 from that part right there. There's one at 0 from that part right there. And there's one at 1. All right, sorry, negative 1 from that part right there. And notice that each of them, if you zoom in really close, start to look like a straight line. Right, like it because it comes from something that's linear. If I look over here, if I zoom in really close, it looks like a straight line at two, and that's because locally it's it's acting like a straight line. So let's mess around with this a little bit. I'm going to make this x minus two squared. So it happens twice there, right? It's like x minus two times x minus two. So here you can tell it looks. If I zoom in, it starts to look like a little local parabola there and because it's happening twice and uh, maybe I could make this one that the x plus one maybe I'll make it happen three times so I'll cube it I'll cube it and if you zoom in on that it starts to look like a little local cubic so from the from the graph and then here the x it, it looks linear so you can see on the graph the shape you can see the multiplicity now, if I switch to, if I make this one into a square, now here at negative 1, looks like a little local parabola. Here at positive 2, local parabola. At 0, still linear. If I make this one cubic, local cube at 2, local parabola. It's not exactly parabola, exactly cube, but it approximates it pretty well. And then a local linear here. Now these zeros, they're also called roots because they, they root it. Those won't change if I multiply by anything out here. And so if I multiply this by like one fifth, say, all that I've done is I've just shrunk it down in this, in this direction, in the up down direction. But notice my zeros are still at the same spot. So from the zeros, I can get not necessarily this part of the equation, but I can get all the rest of the equation, the actual shape. Like if I made this one third instead of one fifth, it's going to look pretty similar, just be not as not as condensed. One half, same idea. So again, a uh, thing to take away from this is if I have a graph and I can look at it like this, I can at least write what this part uh, should be, should be approximately by looking at what uh, if it's a repeated root. Here it's obviously a square because it looks like a little local parabola. Here it's cubic because it looks like a little local cube. So give those uh, questions a try from the homework. Let me know if you have any questions, post them in the forum, or you can message me as well.